order. I call this meeting of the Standing Committee on Health to order. Today is Tuesday, October the 13th, 2020. My name is Suzanne Lonas Croft and I'm the MLA for Lunenburg. Today we will hear from Doctors Nova Scotia regarding the ongoing doctor shortage. After that, we will set an agenda of topics and witnesses for future meetings. So the meeting will, the uh, question period will probably cl close around 2.50, just so that you, you keep that in mind. Um, please set your phones on silent or vibrate. And if we should have an emergency, please exit through the back door, walk down the hill to Hollis Street, and meet at the courtyard of the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. Please keep your masks on during the meeting unless you are speaking. But if you're doing a back and forth with someone, you can keep your mask off. You don't have to keep remasking. So if you're the person asking a question while you're receiving your answer, you, you can leave your mask off. Um, to maintain as much physical distance as possible, we ask that you remain in your seat, if at all possible. And um, we will take a, a 15 minute break if you're all in agreement at uh, two o'clock and then resume the meeting and we will have the meeting end at 3.15. Are we all in agreement for that? Yes, so we have consent by everyone. Um, and to remind, when you leave the chamber, you are to use the doors to the ante rooms and walk around and then go over and take the stairway by the elevator and out the back door to um, the street, or you can go down the flight and go behind the stairs and out the back door. <clears throat> and uh, we will start with our introductions, beginning with the Liberal Caucus. Hi, I'm Ben Jessima. I'm the MLA for Hammonds Plains Lucasville. And uh, might I congratulate our newest uh, cabinet member? Madam Chair. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Horn. Bill Horn, MLA for Waverly Fall River Beaver Bank. And again, nice to hear congratulations to you. Thank you. Mr. Ms. Chair. Uh, Keith Irving, MLA for King South. Congratulations, Madam Chair. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. Uh, I'm Rafa Di Costanzo, the MLA for Clayton Park West, and I adore the new cabinet minister. <laughs> Thank you. I adore you as well. <laughs> well, PC caucus. You don't adore me. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Colton LeBlanc, the MLA for Argyle Barrington, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. And I'm Barbara Adams, the MLA for Coal Harbour Eastern Passage, and of course the PC Party offers our congratulations to you as well. Thank you. Hello, I'm Susan LeBlanc, I'm the MLA for Dartmouth North, and the NDP Caucus also <laughs> offers our congratulations. Thank and, you. And uh, as you, as a... Uh, as uh, the person that I will be asking questions of in the, uh, in the question period, I'm especially excited. Yes. <laughs> Kendra Coombs, Cape Breton Center, welcome. Thank you for being here and congratulations on your, on your you. appointment. Thank you. Dr. McQuarrie, um, we'll have you start the introductions and then you can just go into your opening remarks. So I'm Dr. McQuarrie, Robin McQuarrie, um, and I'm president of Doctors Nova Scotia. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I'm going to pass over to, to Nancy, who's actually going to um, start off our comments. Oh, okay. And introduce the other members of the... Hi. Okay. Perfect. Uh, Hello, Nancy McCready-Williams, CEO of Doctors Nova Scotia. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, and I'd like to introduce my, my two colleagues, Doctor, to my immediate right, Dr. Amanda McDonald, and to my far right, uh, Dr. Leisha Hawker, both family physicians in this, in this province. Thank you, you may right. begin. Right. Thank you so much. <clears throat> As you know, uh, physician recruitment is a national issue, and Nova Scotia is not immune. Doctors are aging. In fact, over 50% of our members of practicing physicians in Nova Scotia are over the age of 50. More than 47,000 Nova Scotians are without a family doctor. While our province is working hard to recruit physicians, 
Doctors Nova Scotia is also working to improve the chances to recruit in this extremely competitive environment so that Nova Scotia is a welcoming place where physicians choose to practice. As the negotiator of physician compensation in Nova Scotia, we work to ensure that Nova Scotia physicians are fairly and competitively compensated. And in our last negotiations with the province, we began advocating specifically for competitive compensation at the maritime and Atlantic Canadian level, such that Nova Scotia can compete with our neighboring provinces. Often, we find ourselves competing for the same resources, physicians graduating from Dalhousie Medical School. We also identified the need to engage physicians in health system change to improve their work environment by reducing red tape at a time when they were not feeling supported and to strengthen their right to representation. Working closely with government, we now have negotiated new contracts that begin to recognize the value of Nova Scotia's doctors and begin to help stabilize some of the most vital services in our healthcare system so that patients have better access to the care they need when they need it. We paid particular attention to specialties that were facing significant recruitment challenges. Family doctors who provide comprehensive care, such as through office visits, emergency medi medicine, inpatient care, nursing homes, obstetrics, maternal care, those family physicians saw significant increase in pay, bringing their compensation to the top in Atlantic Canada. Community-based inpatient hosp uh, hospital inpatient care has been shored up and there's an investment to pilot a new blended capitation payment model for family physicians. These will all help to stabilize Nova Scotia's family physician workforce and significantly improve our opportunity to recruit. Additionally, specialists who practice emergency medicine, obstetrics and gynecology, psychology, or sorry, psychiatry, and anesthesiology saw an increase under these contracts that improved the province's ability to recruit and retain these essential services as well. Government has made a commitment to support succession planning, to reduce administrative red tape, and to focus first-time audits on education. Doctors Nova Scotia has secured physicians' right to representation in all aspects of their contract negotiations, including not only compensation, but also the services that can be required of physicians in exchange for that compensation, through a memorandum of, ag of agreement between Doctors Nova Scotia, the government, and the two health authorities. Nova Scotia is a national leader in the distributed model of medical education, with government, Dalhousie, and the health authorities making great strides with medical education. We've opened up additional undergraduate seats to boost diversity and new residency programs for family medicine and for specialties, which train <coughs> learners in rural communities. We now have two longitudinal integrated clerkship programs in the province, and these are wonderful investments, and we must do all we can to ensure that graduates of these programs stay and practice in Nova Scotia. We are incredibly fortunate to have a medical school in this province, and we need to work collaboratively to reap the rewards of these investments. We believe the contracts signal a new level of support for physicians and will help to make Nova Scotia a go-to destination for physician talent. We're in a national competition to recruit physicians. We've made some great investments through these contracts in medical education and in engaging communities in recruiting, but we cannot be complacent. We must be committed to working together there's much to be done, and Doctors Nova Scotia is looking forward to continuing to partner in this important work. I'll now hand off to Dr. McCory. Dr. McCory. Thank you. I have specific plans to keep my, my comments to a certain period of time, but taking my mask off is incentivizing me to, t to talk longer. <laughs> um, thanks, Nancy. The pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, tested that commitment that, we that Nancy discussed, and government responded and delivered. 
It has been a challenging time for doctors across our province as we adapt and change our practices, care for patients, patients who are more afraid than they've ever been, and protect ourselves and our families from the risks of COVID-19. I'm incredibly proud of my colleagues from Yarmouth to Sydney and everywhere in between who've stepped up in the face of the great uncertainty and fear of what to do best. And often that information of what to do best was changing on the daily basis. Nancy talked about the, the many great investments that were made recently in our, in our contract. These investments were made under the specific goals of fortifying recruitment and retention. As somebody who works in the community, um, the, you know, one doctor is a significant percentage of, of my work cohort. So it's really important that we, we work on not only recruiting, but also retaining doctors in our province, particularly in our communities. <clears throat> I want to focus on one specific investment. It's an investment that's topical across the country, and it's being expected to be a, an investment made in provinces across the country. Virtual care was one of the cornerstones that allowed us to care for patients during the first wave of the pandemic. Our province supported an agreement that was made during the pandemic to enable physicians to bill an office visit for virtual care visits by telephone or video conference. Supporting doctors to work in this way protects the patients from having to leave their homes and sit in a clinic where they could be in contact with somebody with COVID-19. The public also has a great fear about being in crowded spaces right now and are doing their best to adhere to the public health guidelines that are recommended for them. We certainly don't want them seeing their doctor to be somewhere where they have to make an exception. Recently, virtual care codes were extended to the end of this year, which is great news for both doctors and their patients as we anticipate the second wave. The extension provides doctors a certainty that we need to book our clinics for the next few months, knowing that some of these appointments can be virtual. I say some of these appointments because obviously a part of medicine is, is putting your hands on somebody, examining them, and, and really assessing what their needs are. We've been able to reserve our in-person appointments for patients who really need it and also ensure that public health guidelines of social distancing are followed. Virtual care does not replace the need for an in-person care, but it can complement a patient's care and provide access for all patients. Beyond the pandemic, virtual care is a way to make it more convenient for fake patients to get the care they need. Public polling shows that 90%, 95% of patients who receive virtual care during COVID-19 were completely or mostly satisfied with that experience. I think most people would take a 95% approval rating in this room. Um, <laughs> Though virtual care, through virtual care, doctors can provide advice, advice on changes to care plan. They can triage new health concerns. They can counsel people with anxiety. They can refer patients to specialists and specialists can review test results and determine care plans. As a specialist myself, I'm a surgeon. I can't do that virtually yet. Um, maybe if somebody wants to invest in a big robot, we can uh, talk about that, but um, we, it has allowed me to provide reproductive access during COVID in a way that would have drastically changed the lives of women in this province if they were not able to receive reproductive care. So that is one of the ways in which being able to do virtual care has allowed me to really direct the needs of the patients. I work in a community in which not everybody provides all different services, and it was important to me that the patients in my community weren't um, left alone even as I was following the, the guidelines. Other provinces have also implemented virtual care as a permanent tool when an in-person appointment is not needed. As such, we've, imp we've improved Nova Scotia's ability to attract and retain physicians. We must keep up with the other provinces. So this is focusing a little bit more on that retention piece. Virtual care is here to stay because the patients want it to be here to stay. And it's important that we are competitive with the other provinces in a way to do so. It must be an option for patients to see a doctor by telephone or video conference appointment, an option. Every encounter doesn't necessarily require an in-office visit. We need to fully leverage both virtual visits and secure methods to be able to make email and texting patients as well. We can bring our healthcare system into the future to deliver safe and quality care, improved access and convenience for our patients. We're advocating to continue this support and make virtual care a part of the way care is delivered in our province on a permanent basis. I'm gonna hand off now to Drs. Amanda McDonald and Leisha Hawker, and they're gonna share their experiences with you. Okay, Dr. McDonald. Dr. McDonald. 
I'm a family physician that co-founded Windsor Collaborative Practice. I also work in long-term care, I'm a MAID provider, I'm a network lead with Nova Scotia Health and sit on the Doctors Nova Scotia Board of Directors. When I started my practice, it was quite varied. I was doing hospitalist, long-term care, clinic, and working in emergency departments throughout the province. And I love the variety. Um, further, having trained in a rural, longitudinal-based residency program in the Annapolis Valley, I felt competent to do that breadth of work. However, it was a monthly scheduling juggernaut. I was managing six different schedules that were all independently made that had little flexibility within them. And so if, if an event or illness came, the whole stack of cards came down. So when I started my family, I didn't want to continue working within that scheduling matrix, so I narrowed my focus. And in doing so, I kept the pieces where I had more control. Control to schedule, control to modify, and control to make the work fit around my life and not the other way around. And I missed the variety of medicine that I was providing, but my job satisfaction remains really high, and I think that's because I've instilled a work-life balance. The challenge of practicing comprehensively is that it's based on the premise that the physician is available Monday to Friday, 8 to 5, after hours, and weekends. And there isn't much flexibility for different working arrangements. It's often very much an all or nothing unless you're doing a solely clinic-based practice. As equal numbers of women to men are now practicing medicine, we need to have increased consideration for the fact that those who are phenotypically female may need time off to have children and flexibility following in that. And parents, regardless of gender, within my generation, are very involved and hands-on with their families, and that takes time. Too often, physicians are forced into work styles that don't align with their personal lives. Creating flexibility is one of our biggest opportunities for us to recruit and retain physicians in Nova Scotia. Allowing physicians to balance aggressive schedules with family commitments lets them provide comprehensive medicine consistently while reducing burnout and improves community access to the care that they need. It's time to shake up how the work is actually organized in our province. And that requires challenging and emotional conversations to examine which pieces of care delivery should remain the same and which pieces should be reorganized. Shaking up the system also means supporting collaborative care, not competitive care. We need to look at how care is delivered at holistically as a system and adjust payment models to better reflect comprehensive and quality care rather than just volume-driven metrics. Technology has a huge role to play in this. By increasing patient access to care and to allow physicians to maximize their ability to have high output of quality work, we have an opportunity to create a really great system that improves access to care, is desirable to work in, and is cost neutral to current spending. Thank you. And now Dr. Leisha Hawker. Dr. Hawker. Thank you, Dr. McDonald. I've worked at the North End Community Health Centre just down the road, um, providing primary care for the past seven years. I'm also an addictions physician at the Regency Park Clinic and a family physician for the Newcomer Clinic we provide primary care to newly arrived refugee claimants and refugees. In my first five years of practice, I also did locum work in remote flying communities of the Northwest Territories. I've served on the boards of the Nova Scotia College of Family Physicians and Doctors Nova Scotia. I am currently co-chair of the Doctors Nova Scotia eHealth Committee, which is a group of 10 of my peers with a single mission in mind creating a future in which Nova Scotian physicians and patients have access to the best e-health tools to support high quality care. I want to echo my colleagues about the importance of virtual care, using either the telephone or online video conference to connect with my patients has opened a new world of possibilities in my practice. And the main benefactors are my patients. Patients with limited mobility or transportation issues, single parents at home with small children, patients staying at shelters who otherwise would have relied on the emergency department for acute care, employees who can't leave their work sites to get to my office, patients with substance use disorders who may have a hard time accessing an in-person appointment exactly on time, as well patients outside of our central zone now have more equitable access for medical assistance and dying assessments as most physician assessors are located in Halifax. 
Lastly, patients who are vulnerable and at high risk of complications from COVID-19 can access care without coming into a crowded clinic. Virtual care must be a part of the future for the benefit of patients and providers. That means continuing to include the telephone since many of my patients are unable to connect for video appointments because they either can't access, manage, or understand the technology. And virtual care must also expand and improve to help me connect with my patients in ways that works for both of us. I'd love to be able to notify a group of my patients about a new program at my community health center or the next flu shot clinic. Secure messaging would allow my patients on daily witness methadone to manage changes in their prescription in their pharmacy without having to contact their case manager every time. It's important for Nova Scotia to invest in secure messaging solutions for providers so there's fast and efficient alternatives for connecting with our patients. Looking forward, I also ask that we plan and implement information systems to ensure that providers and patients can securely access information from anywhere. It's a nightmare trying to piece together different sources of information on one patient. With today's technology, we can and should overcome these barriers. As physicians, we are working to make this happen. Nova Scotia is a wonderful place to live and work, and I enjoy the privilege of caring for my patients every day. Doctors Nova Scotia is committed to working with our partners and doing our part to recruit and retain physicians in this beautiful province. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hawker. And we will take questions now, starting with the PC Caucus, Mr. LeBlanc, for 20 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for joining us this afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the committee, and I'd like to thank you all and your, all your colleagues for uh, the very important work that you do each and every day, but uh, particularly over the last uh, number of months, so thank you. Um, a topic that was highlighted in pretty much everybody's opening remarks was the element of, of technology and how um, the changing landscape of primary care has to, I guess, reflect the um, technological advances that, are, that exist. Um, back in 2000, or back in February of this year, our leader, uh, Tim Houston, highlighted that expanding healthcare delivery uh, through means of virtual care uh, could essentially improve the system. Um, and it was being done uh, in many other jurisdictions uh, around the world. Yet, uh, a couple months, a couple weeks later, the Premier in this House uh, sort of dismissed the idea, uh, mocked the idea uh, of virtual care, and. To, to quote, said that Mr. Houston thought the best way to deliver primary care was for all of us to sit in our living rooms and call a doctor. Somewhere between then and, and March 18th, there was a uh, illuminating realization uh, in the Premier's office that, hey, virtual care can work for Nova Scotians, and it's a shame that COVID-19 had to be that mechanism for, for the government to implement it. Delighted to see it uh, being accessed uh, by so many Nova Scotians and, and to hear of government support uh, for at least till December uh, 31st of this year. We know it's a viable option. Um, your former president said that it's, uh, quote, simple, straightforward, it's good for the public. Uh, they don't have to leave their homes, they save money, they don't have to find someone to take them in. So uh, I, I guess that line of questioning is, is to begin is, how is this going to make um, delivery of healthcare more efficient, not only for uh, Nova Scotians, but for physicians and members of your organization? Anybody? <laughs> Who would like to take that? Dr. McDonald? I can, I can start and then I'll hand to Dr. Hawker. In terms of access and efficiency, what we are seeing now with our virtual encounters is there's subtle time saving. It's the three minutes that it takes the patient to enter and exit the clinic room. I'm not having to drive. And all of that aggregates to increase time for patient care. However, the biggest, um, but the appointment lengths themselves are about the same in length. So we're not saving a lot of time there. But the access piece, I think, comes to the point that I can deliver care kind of anytime, anywhere. For example, I'm here today, as you can see, and not in clinic. So to offset that loss of access, I've opened up several hours of virtual appointments tonight after I put the kids to bed. 
And that's not something I would have been able to do previously because seeing people in person requires front staff availability. You have to get to and from the clinic. So there's a lot more flexibility in how we can deliver care in terms of access for that. Um, in terms of patients, to your point, it is there's a number of patient populations that really benefit from this access of care. Um, Dr. Hawker's point, single mothers in particular, those with precarious em employment. And I, I see so often, I have an older practice and there's so many caregivers that have to take time off work to take their loved one into their appointment. So these are some of the demographics I'm finding this most, uh, most beneficial to. Dr. Hawker. Thank you for the question. I just want to echo what Dr. McDonald said. The efficiencies I see might not be as much office-based, but it's so much more efficient for my patients and their lives. People who are working, I've had them in their staff rooms or they've walked a block away on like a on a quick break and they just love not having to take a taxi or get in their car and drive to my clinic, wait 15 minutes to see me and then drive back to work. The amount of time that they miss from work is considerable and I'm sure their employers also appreciate this change. Um, and to echo what Dr. McDonald said about uh, single parents, a lot of my patients have really young children, babies and toddlers. And the last thing they want to do right now is get on a bus and go to a clinic. So they also, I love doing my video chats with the moms and parents at home too, because I get to see kind of what their day-to-day -day life is like, the dogs barking in the background and the children are popping in and out of the visit and saying hi. Um, it gives me a good picture of what their life is like, especially my patients with substance use disorders. It gives me a, a better insight into what what's going on. Um, Lastly, the flexibility is key, not just for myself and like Dr. McDonald said with her schedule, but for my patients. So some of my patients with substance use disorders uh, really struggle to attend an in-person visit on time before they would have to rebook for the following week. My addictions clinic is only once a week. And now I'm often able to just pick a time that works for both of us and fit them in between my other schedule while I'm at a different clinic um, and, and do that visit virtually so that they don't go without the care that they need urgently. Mr. LeBlanc. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Dr. McDonald and Dr. Hawker, for your answers. Um, we know that as of September 2nd, uh, more than 919,000 services were provided virtually by physicians in Nova Scotia. Um, do we know roughly um, how many physicians in Nova Scotia are, are t taking part in the, uh, the ability to provide services virtually? Just a rough estimate. Ms. McCready-Williams? Uh, the majority of physicians are, are reaching to virtual care as a tool in their toolkit. Uh, and so um, uh, we, we know that. Mr. LeBlanc. Thank you very much. Um, is there an idea of how many virtual appointments will essentially transition into a follow-up in-person appointment? Or like, you know, it, it's not to replace, virtual care doesn't replace in-person visits rather complement, so for the follow-ups, so if it's a prescription change or, or whatnot, or the examples that you have noted. Um, I guess is there a, a rough percentage of, of how many um, cases or instances that, that would be taking place? I can answer from... Oh, excuse me, Dr. McCory? <laughs> I can answer from my perspective. Um, as, as a specialist, we're not often bringing people back, you know, on the regular. Um, I would say in my practice, about 40% of my visits right now are virtual. Um, I do try to make sure that I can have, there's certain things I have to see with my own eyes. I can't do certain exams. You know, there are some ways, some things you can see over a virtual visit. As a gynecologist, it's not appropriate or um, possible at this stage to, to do so. So we, for me, it's about 40%. It allows me to um, be a little more efficient in my workday. I was working at about 50% because of COVID regulations. I share an office with other physicians. I'm now able to take that time where I have to space my patient. I can pop in two uh, virtual visits. It's more convenient for my elderly pop. So I actually work in Bridgewater and see, would see women from your, your area. Um, and that's a long drive to Bridgewater from Cape Island. So in, in my practice, I've. I've been able to follow up for things that are medication surveillance a little more easily. And really, I'd only bring somebody in 
um, if, if I needed to see them physically, but they may ask to come in. And then if they ask to come in, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe, maybe there's something that I'm not getting in that visit. So I would, I would not encourage to say, well, you know, we shouldn't have a follow-up. There may be something may come up in that virtual visit that we need to follow up with the patient. Mr. LeBlanc. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess the benefits to both the physician community and to Nova Scotians may not be endless, but uh, they're certainly not limited. Um, so I'm happy that, to hear that's working very well so far and, and hope to hear that uh, it's, uh, it's continued uh, in the future. Um, I guess to hone in a little bit more on, on the topic of, of today's uh, meeting um, regarding the ongoing doctor shortage. Um, you know, some may remember back in 2013 uh, that there was a, a promise that every Nova Scotian would have a doctor within th three years of of uh, the current government, uh, current government assuming power. Yet today, there's still over 48,000 Nova Scotians uh, who are self-identified on the Need a Family Practice Registry. So it, I guess it's shameful that we, we're, we have the magnitude of the issue that we have today. Um, and I question whether that, that commitment, uh, or that undertaking rather, um, at the time, um, by the government, uh, if they fail to comprehend the full magnitude of the issue. Um, regarding the, the Family Practice Registry, um, back in 2017, uh, there was a Stats Canada report saying that there was 90,000 90, Nova Scotians on that Family Practice Registry. Uh, and the numbers were quite similar, 48,000, I believe, at the time. That's like one in 20 Nova Scotians that don't have a family doctor. And in my area, that's we're, we're double the average of the provincial average. We have more than 12%. So looking at um, the 90,000 that was put out by Stats Canada and the 48,000 that we have today in Nova Scotia, uh, how valid do you believe that the data collected by NSHA uh, for the family practice registry uh, is accurate? And who'd like to take that? Ms. McCready Williams? Okay. The, um, we can't comment on the accuracy of Nova Scotia Health's data. We don't have access to that data. Um, so we, we, we trust that those are the numbers, that there are 47,000 um, Nova Scotians seeking access to a, to a family physician. We wouldn't have any other data otherwise. Mr. O. Ms. Adams? Thank you very much. And so I'm going to ask the next few questions. So for clarity's sake, um, of course, Mr. Blanc and I are both health professionals, and I've used virtual care for 15 years in practice. So I'm delighted that you're finally getting an opportunity to take advantage of that. Um, we believe it should be permanent. We believe the government should announce that it's permanent. Um, there was also, and thank you for sending it to us, the, the virtual care report of the virtual care task force recommendations from February 2020. Um, we would like to see a provincial virtual care task force for the province of Nova Scotia to make sure that all of the things that you're asking for, um, we are able to take advantage of for you. So I just want to be very clear on that. Um, the number of Nova Scotians without a family doctor, I have the only constituency in Nova Scotia without a family doctor. There's 86 collaborative health centers. We don't have one of those either. Um, so I want to go to the Nova Scotia Health Authority's numbers just to get, um, because they are published, the Nova Scotia Health Authority by the numbers. The latest ones that just came out show that 2018, 2019, there was 2,687 licensed physicians in Nova Scotia. And the new numbers for 2019, 2020 show 2,287. So that's 400 fewer licensed physicians in Nova Scotia, according to the NSHA's own numbers. Does that sound accurate to you? Does that match with what you're feeling in terms of your own account of physicians in the province? That's a lot of lost physicians. Ms. McCready Williams. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so I can speak to our own data. Um, all practicing physicians, retired physicians, students, and residents are members of Doctors Nova Scotia. Uh, and, um, and in total, uh, these, are, these are 2020 numbers. Um, we have practicing physicians, 2,553 practicing physicians. Um, 
and uh, and 53% uh, would be specialists, and 47% would be family physicians. Ms. Adams. Thank you. What would, would the number have been last year for the number of physicians? You said it was 2,553 this year. What was it last year? Ms. McCready-Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, 2019 numbers, there were 2,498. So there might be a distinction in the numbers um, by virtue of perhaps Nova Scotia Health is not reporting IWK physicians in there. That might, that might account for the, the variation in the numbers. I'm not sure. I can only hypothesize. Um, Ms. But, oh, yeah. Sorry. Ms. Uh, Adams. Thank you. According to the find a, finding a primary care provider stats numbers, um, for the last three quarters, there's been an increase in the number of people without a, a family doctor in Nova Scotia. So just in the central zone in the last quarter, there was an increase of 21%. In um, uh, the eastern zone, it was 5.9%. So according to the Atlantic Quarterly that is produced for Doctors Nova Scotia, on page eight there, it shows the number of physicians, uh, people who say, I do not have a family doctor and I've not been looking for one. I do not have a family doctor and I'm trying to find one. And it goes every year for five years straight. If we go back to 2015, it's showing that 4% said, I don't have a doctor and I'm looking. 3% said, I don't have a doctor and I'm not looking. So that's a total of 7% of Nova Scotians surveyed said they did not have a family doctor. In, two, in the second quarter of 2020, 7% said they did not have a family doctor and they were looking, and 7% said, I don't have a family doctor and I'm not looking. So that's 14%. So that's twice as many people surveyed from five years ago are saying they don't have a family doctor. So is it your understanding with the reporting of the numbers for your own profession that more people are reporting that they do not have a family doctor than compared to five years ago, based on these numbers. Ms. McCready-Williams. Yes, thank you. Um, certainly, um, the, the fact that there's a physician shortage is not a, is not a surprise. We've been talking about that for five years. So, uh, and, uh, and so we know on average, um, based on a physician resourcing plan that, that all partners would have, have created and put in place about 10 years ago. We then, based on demographics and aging population, and including the, the cohort of physicians in this province, we knew we would need to recruit at least 100 doctors a year uh, for, the, for the following 10 years uh, in order to, to meet the number of physicians who would be leaving, either leaving practice, leaving the province, et cetera, et cetera. And so, so if you just take a look at the last like four or five years uh, since uh, physician recruitment has really been a focus of the system, and it is a team sport. There's no one organization that can do it on its own. It is a, it is a, it is, while it is the responsibility of the health authority or Nova Scotia Health, um, Doctors Nova Scotia plays a role in partnership, partnership, community recruitment groups like Healthy, Pictou County, and Lunenburg Now, et cetera, et cetera, are also playing uh, important roles as is the medical school, et cetera. But we know that, that, that there's been, a, there's been a, a physician shortage reported anywhere between, I think there's 130 some odd vacancies right now. That was as high as 200 uh, four or five years ago. Um, and, and just based on our own numbers of how many members, um, you know, while we may recruit anywhere from, you know, uh, 100 to 150 a year to this province, 80 leave. So they either leave practice, they either retire, they may leave the province, etc. So, so we're never, we are, we're, we're a little, we're marginally further ahead every year. Uh, but we still have a physician shortage. We're not recruiting in enough physicians to meet the need right now. Um, and that's, that's everybody's responsibility, no one organization's responsibility. Um, and, uh, and, but, and so what we, what, in response to your question, do we get the sense of there's, there's a greater and greater demand for physicians? Um, yes, we do, but we're also seeing the impact on the existing physicians of those physician shortages in terms of, of burnout 
in terms of exhaustion, in terms of long hours, in terms of sort of an unsustainable um, level of, of, of stress. Uh, and so, and, and that's been markedly so, particularly in the pandemic. Uh, and so we, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Dr. McQuarrie. One of the things I just wanted to comment on as well is the um, pandemic expedited a variety of things, but if you look at the numbers for physician providers in the province, you'll see that about a third of them are over 55 years of age. Um, and that speaks to me to the importance of retaining the, the people that we have in the province. And we've got some really interesting um, numbers around residents that graduate, who's from the Maritimes, who's not, and how many stay in the Maritimes. And so I, I think there was certainly, I know of a couple of my colleagues who were maybe um, shuttled along their pathway to retirement a little more quickly in the setting of COVID and the risk factors for them working in the public. Um, in obstetrics, we didn't shut down. We carried on the same as you would in emergency. And, and the risk of exposure for some of our physicians became sort of an impetus to move towards retirement. Some of those physicians did regular locum work for us, for example, and it was time to, to move on based on the pandemic. <clears throat> Ms. Adams. Thank you very much. I, I, I noted the word you said marginally further ahead. The numbers don't suggest that we are actually in fact further ahead. It does suggest to me though that we've, it says according to here we've lost 400 physicians registered compared to the year before. And so I know that when we talk about getting people off the need a family practice registry, we're actually talking about a combination of physicians versus plus clinical nurse practitioners. So it's, so there's two different bodies that are responsible for getting those numbers down. And yet we've gone from 7% saying they don't have a primary care provider five years ago to 14% now. And that's a, that's a, I'm calling you up and asking you kind of survey. So I'm just wondering with the time that I have left, if you can talk about what we can do differently moving forward. I know that we had the collective agreement, which was a, a movement in the right direction. We added clinical nurse practitioners and collaborative practices, um, but yet the numbers are not showing that more people are attached to someone. Uh, virtual care is obviously one strategy to help attach people, but it doesn't replace the in-person visit. So of all of the things that could be done in addition to what's already in the collective agreement, what would be the one best thing that we could do to help get people attached to a family doctor that's not already happening right now? Who would like to take that? Dr. McQuarrie? So I think... Uh, <clears throat> We have an incredible resource in the Maritimes in the form of Dalhousie University. Uh, we, we work closely with our partners at uh, Maritime Doctors to get the information about residents who are finishing. But if you're looking to say, who, you know, what's that, where's that pot of gold that we want a piece of? The, pe the pot of gold is people who are graduating. I think we're seeing Dalhousie really do a lot of work right now to transition, particularly to community work. So the ivory tower approach of educating medical learners is changing. We're seeing more medical learners come out into the community. The benefit of working in the community is that you may choose to live and practice in the community. So in 2019, 51% of residents that started at Dalhousie were not from the Maritimes. That's huge. Think, 51% of those residents, Dalhousie is such a draw, they were able to bring in 51% that weren't from the Maritimes. Of that, 68% go on to practice. So that means some people go on to finish their residency. They're not lost and say, hey, medicine isn't for me, because frankly, they couldn't afford to do that at that stage. But um, they, they're probably continuing their education in some manner. But 68% are beginning practice. Of that 68%, 74% are been getting practice in the Maritimes. So what if we made that share of within the Maritimes to be 80% in the Maritimes and 90% in Nova Scotia? And so what's important in, in creating that number, they're our resource. So in, in creating that number, we need to make the environment appealing to new grads who want to think about some of the things that Dr. McDonald spoke of, think about balancing their life and work. Think about, I mean, the reality is you're graduating somewhere in your early 30s. Retirement is something you think about closer to 70 as a physician. So you, you want an attractive place. 
Oh, Dr. McDonald. Just a further comment to that. I, as I mentioned, I trained in the Valley Residency Program um, in the first in, in, in narration of that. And as of 2019, out of the 29 residents that completed the program, 26 stayed in Nova Scotia, 18 of which were, remained in the Valley. And of the remaining, the rest have return of service agreements within Nova Scotia, myself being one. OK. Ms. Adams. Thank you. Um, I uh, worked in long-term care for six months at Ocean View Continuing Care Center during the pandemic. And I know that our particular facility in Eastern Passage lost its um, medical director and the physicians who were there uh, 15 or 16 months ago. Um, and I know that you mentioned that you worked in long-term care. And so I'm wondering, I know that physicians are saying that it's a less attractive place to work um, sometimes because of the scheduling the way it works. Um, certainly one of the things that one of you mentioned about having a better on-call system for physicians. I'm the one who was trying to get hold of you. So I would certainly think that that would be a, a great thing um, to do. I'm wondering if you can talk about the fact that physicians are not necessarily wanting to work in that area and what in the collective agreement addressed that or what else can be addressed um, because last year, December, I think it was DeBert and Truro um, long-term care facilities lost, lost their medical director and they were not going to admit people back into the facility if they went into hospital. So I just wondered if you could talk about the challenges of recruiting physicians for long-term care. Dr. McDonald. So as I mentioned, I, I do long-term care work um, and that was that's still one of the pieces mentioned in my opening comments how it's the assumption is you're available Monday to Friday 8 to 5. So it is not uncommon for me if I'm home on a Wednesday with my kids to have to pack them up and go in and sign a death certificate or do orders, et cetera. So the way in which the medicine is delivered, I think is one of the areas we need to look at reorganizing in terms of the how. Um, in terms of physician retention, throughout the province, there will be multiple physicians on call formally for long-term care facilities and informally without pay for very low volumes. And it, for, for me, it's not the monetary piece. It's if I can't go to my cottage my parents' cottage with no cell service for a week, that's a cost to me. And to me, that seems like something that could very easily be centralized and rely more on EHS services. Nurse practitioners are more and more involved with long-term care work, but they're only functioning at the eight to five. They're not kind of sharing the ugly hours, so to speak. So I think there's a lot that could be done within long-term care space. Order. Time has lapsed for the PC caucus. We'll turn over to the NDP caucus for 20 minutes. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. It's a great conversation. Um, getting back to virtual care for a second, it seems like everyone in this room is in agreement that virtual care is, uh, is really important and uh, needs to be supported. Um, uh, and of course, we've heard that it's being extended until the end of December. Um, so the big question is, <laughs> how come only, only to the end of De December? So I'm wondering if, uh, without doing the big preamble, can you explain um, what, the hur what you understand the hurdles are from the government uh, in keeping the service available? So surely there's conversations going on to extend it past uh, December. Maybe you can't speak about those actual conversations, but what, what is the government saying I is the issue? Ms. McCready-Williams. So at a high level, we've been told, um, I've been told that government um, is, is wanting to bring a risk management approach to this topic uh, and to gain a better understanding of what virtual care might look like post-pandemic. So, so um, it's a new modality of communication as between patient and physician uh, and they're wanting to make sure uh, that there are, there are no unintended uh, impacts of making decisions uh, uh, that need to be made. Uh, we've said very clearly that uh, it needs to absolutely continue for all the, re the clinical care reasons you've heard uh, my colleagues speak of uh, and patient care uh, reasons and patient satisfaction reasons uh, beyond the end of the year. Uh, and so, and we're, we're, we're delighted uh, we're going to be starting those conversations with government uh, very shortly about what that could look like moving forward. I'd love to understand what specifically they're, wor they're, they're worried about. Uh, 
And uh, the good news is that every province is having these same conversations right now. Uh, this is an issue that uh, is, is top of mind for every province. Uh, and uh, Alberta, for example, has, has made those codes, has, has made virtual care permanent. Uh, and others uh, are sort of going a little more slowly. So we're delighted to be part of those conversations and hoping that we can, we can address whatever issues need to be addressed prior to the end of December. Ms. LeBlanc. Yeah, great. Um, so yes, one of the things we've heard the Deputy Minister talk about is quality, safety and control issues, quote, uh, quote, quality, safety and control, end quote, uh, with regard to the practice uh, and the need to understand best practices. Um, and so it sounds to me like maybe you can't help uh, me understand this, but uh, at this point, but what kind of data or information exactly is the government looking for, or what will they be basing their, their decisions on? Is it simply uh, like privacy issues? Do we, do we know exactly what they're looking for? It, M Ms. McCready-Williams. Oh, we don't at this point. Yeah. Ms. LeBlanc. Okay, thanks. Um, I just want to say the best part about telehealth for me has been the combination of in-person and telehealth because uh, when I had to go to an in-person appointment during the pandemic, there was literally no one in the waiting room and I got in within five minutes and normally I have actually a, quite a long wait. Uh, so it was delightful. Uh, I was happy, happy. Um, uh, in, so we were talking just a minute ago about doctor burnout and physician burnout. Um, in May 2017, Doctors Nova Scotia partnered with Dr. Michael Leitner uh, from Acadia to conduct a comprehensive study on physician burnout. The report concluded that physicians are struggling to manage workload, participants scored extremely high on exhaustion, cynicism and, and efficacy indicators. Uh, physicians felt a profound lack of respect for their professional expertise and autonomy, and only 40% agreed that it was, quote, possible to provide high quality care to all of my patients, end quote. So the report concluded that the most impactful way to improve doctor burnout in Nova Scotia was to improve physicians' relationship with the NSHA, or NS Health now. Um, so my first question is, can you tell us about how the dynamic uh, has evolved since the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the, the, the dynamic of, of physician burnout in general, but also if, there is a, if, if the dynamic has changed between doctors and NS Health? Ms. McCready-Williams. Great. So, um, yes, uh, just speaking quickly to that report and to the science of, of physician burnout. Uh, there is a science to this, and there's experts, uh, particularly south of the border, Tate Schoenefeld and others who have studied this. Uh, uh, and and uh, largely, the, the, some of the biggest drivers of burnout are not about a lack of self-care. Uh, it's not about doing yoga or more mindfulness training. It's about a feeling of uh, powerlessness and hopelessness with the lived work experience of being a physician for a whole host of reasons. Um, and, um, and so, uh, and, and part of that at the time, physicians self-reported a feeling of being disengaged with Nova Scotia Health, the health authority at the time. Your question talks about, spoke to about what's the, been the COVID experience, and I'm really pleased to say that I think it's because you know uh, we've been in a crisis, and you know the crisis brought out the best in everybody. You know every organization in the healthcare system rose to the challenge, and we witnessed and were part of a coming together of the health system to respond for the common good, for the public good, in a way we hadn't seen in a long time. And I think that would be, I wouldn't want to speak for everybody, but certainly my colleagues uh, around the province feel a level of engagement. Physicians feel a level of engagement with decision makers, uh, particularly the health authorities, um, that they hadn't experienced prior to the pandemic. So it was a sort of a coming together for the common good and breaking down the barriers and clearing whatever assumptions people might be holding of one another and just getting the work done. And that was our lived experience. Uh, we, did, we did great work together. Uh, and so I think that um, physicians are feeling, are feeling certainly more engaged now than they, they were at the time of Dr. Uh, Leiter's report. Dr. McClory. I think one of the things that 
you would certainly think, how are people feeling with respect to burnout at the end of a pandemic? Not at the end of it, I wish it was the end of a yeah. pandemic. Um, but you know, after the first wave of a pandemic is probably not better, would be what you would, would think. But in fact, I think it goes to show that it's not about, um, physician burnout isn't just about long hours. We've all been putting in long hours. Um, for me, the biggest takeaway and the joy of being a doctor is when my work is valued and my work is appreciated. And I've never had patients more thankful than they've been right now. I've never had patients ask me, how are you doing? than they, they are right now. And I think um, de-escalating the tone of you know, the contentious, you know, there's so many preconceived notions of what it's like to be a doctor and um, that it, you know, we're all driving around on our yachts <laughs> and uh, having the weekend off and that's certainly not my lived experience. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that's really been meaningful is to have the, the system when they asked, we volunteered to, to show up um, for, for whatever was needed. Um, and for the most part, it's really just having the system say, thank you for being here, and having the patient say the same. Dr. McDonald. I completely agree. I've never felt more valued as a physician um, as I have these last few months. And it has really kind of given me the juice to, to do the work. I would say probably, and I don't know if Dr. Hawker would agree, but speaking to my family medicine colleagues, I do suspect there's higher levels of burnout because what I have seen, my lived experience, has been unprecedented mental health concerns in our daily daily care. I, I, during the kind of the crisis of most, I, every complaint, every patient had, it was a three-pronged, so there was whatever the visit was for, and then you're addressing their mental health concerns, and then they're worried about me, and they're worried about my family. So each encounter had kind of had that pattern, and there were times, it's much better now, but there were times that it was very challenging work because you care so much about your patients and they struggled, they really did, and still are in many cases. Ms. LeBlanc. Well, thanks, I'm really happy to hear that. Um, uh, and it is kind of amazing how, as you said, Dr. Macquarie, that um, such a terrible time can reveal some really amazing, shine some light on some amazing things. Um, so in this pandemic, we've heard some, from some healthcare practitioners that they're concerned uh, that the COVID-19 testing and 811 times may worsen backlogs in, within the healthcare system itself. So um, it's, you know, like it, the, the concern would be for teachers, for example, or anyone who works in frontline care who has a family and whose kids are going to school now. Um, but we've heard this especially uh, might be true for healthcare practitioners practitioners who have school age children. I'm not sure what, how old your kids are, but um, you know, they, if your kid needs a test, then you're home with the kid and you know, we, we know the story. Um, but waiting for, testing, for the testing appointment and the results. Uh, and I understand that in some cases, healthcare practitioners have an expedited uh, access to testing, but it still remains a concern in the healthcare system uh, in, in general. Um, I'm wondering if uh, you're hearing from your members, if you're hearing this concern from members uh, or if you're experiencing it yourself, uh, and if you can tell us about uh, what you know is being t done to address the issue of, the, of testing and waiting. Dr. McCory. Um, so I can tell you a little bit about the expedited access. The expedited access is available um, for those of us that are going to be on call. Um, the numbers of accesses you can imagine across the country, the need for these tests is, is quite high. Um, and so there's a, a limited number of tests available and would be available if you were on call and therefore going to be clinically required, um, say in the hospital, for example. Um, all of us are mothers to, uh, well, yours aren't in school yet. <laughs> Uh, yours aren't in school. Well, mine are school age, so I've got um, day two of back to school. We got COVID tested, so it was super fun. Um, my husband's a police officer in Coal Harbor, and he's been pretty busy too. Um, and so it has been a balance of of figuring those sort of things out. I think our patients are a little more understanding, but um, 
I really feel like that's an opportunity where virtual care came in. So the day that I had to not go to school because or my kids didn't go to school, so I couldn't go to work. Um, I got my COVID test organized that day and um, was then able to see probably about half of my patients. Some of them were scheduled to be virtual. Some we were able to call the patient and say, do you think we could address this virtually? Uh, and so in that situation, we were able to make a little bit better use of that time. Um, I am sure, and Nancy's heard me speak of this at length, of I've taken many calls in my bedroom with the door locked and in the closet because the first door is to lock so the kids can't get in and the second door is to close so that you don't hear them Order. screaming at the door. <laughs> Order, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and we'll come back, and we'll let you finish, Dr. McCory. <laughs> uh, I forgot to introduce our, our um, wonderful clerks, <laughs> Judy Kavanoff and Sherry Mitchell, and our ledge counsel, Mr. Gordon Hebb, are also here, is, is ledge TV. So I know I forgot something in the introductions. <laughs> we'll be back. Uh, re remember to exit into the ante rooms and out and uh, washrooms are to the left and there's water out front as well.
order. Um, Dr. McCory, you may continue on with your uh, reply. Oh, okay, okay. okay um, but I think I just wanted to continue on on the statement that um, physicians, and in particular female physicians, whether we um, like it or not, typically most of the burden of organizing things like when your children are home from school, um, that often falls to us. Um, many families are two physician families, and uh, you know the one who can do the virtual care tries to do it, but um, it's a lot of moving around and, and the wait times for 811 certainly were an issue, but I do think they've worked really hard to be responsive to the, the quick turnaround needs. Oh. Yes, thank you. Um, I, you know, um, <laughs> I also have school-aged children and, uh, and uh, like many, many people who worked from home, it was a kind of a particular challenge uh, to be able to, to manage all of that. But yes, it's absolutely sh for sure true that the bulk of those kinds of, like the emotional labor of that kind of organizing falls, to, if it's a, if it's a um, husband and wife uh, deal, then it falls to the, the female generally. Uh, so um, on that, I'm wondering if anyone would like to talk about, could talk about childcare challenges in general during the pandemic. Um, among the membership during the first wave uh, and what impact they had on the physician workforce and if there are things going on to sort of prepare for a second wave or even, God forbid, a third wave. Dr. McDonald? Um, I, I'm quite fortunate that we have a nanny for childcare. Um, it's more costly than I could probably afford at this point in my career, but given the nature of my work and the need for flexibility and the nature of my husband's work, it was the option for us. And she, in my case, she was fantastic and continued and, and essentially bubbled with us. But for so many of my colleagues, childcare was the biggest concern of COVID, not their personal risk um, in terms of developing COVID, but how am I going to show up to work because the emergency departments don't stop. And certainly in some of the physician forms we're on online, that is a concern that is often echoed. And there was a lot of, um, I think, discrimination against providing childcare for frontline workers. A lot of female physicians had their nannies quit on them because they were worried about the risk of, of taking home, um, given the work they're doing. So in terms of you know active work in that vein, um, not that I'm aware of, but I know it's been an ongoing concern for many. And I, I think that's far beyond physicians, that's nurses, that's paramedics, that's, that's us all. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you. I'm going to pass the rest of my time to Ms. Coombs. Ms. Coombs. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, succession planning. So um, as in what you've discussed today earlier, Dr. McCready and Dr. McQuarrie, uh, you've both stated that 50% of physicians are over 50. Um, so I'm just wondering, can you tell us roughly the number of vacancies uh, that would be if it included the pending retirements in the next, say, three years or so. Ms. McCready Williams. The only data that I have around that is what Nova Scotia Health publishes, and uh, and typically, as I understand it, the process is is is, is when a physician. Um, is interested and anticipating a retirement and they actually have a date in mind. It could be two years down the road, it could be a year down the road. They, um, they're encouraged to let the health authority know so that the planning can start right away in terms of trying to find someone to take that spot. Um, right now, I think there, there are over 130 vacancies. Right now, again, I've seen it as high as 200, uh, you know, three or four years ago. If I could just add one more thing uh, to this, is that one um, uh, process that we talked about uh, in the last contract negotiations that we'd love a little bit more transparency about is um, a transition in, a transition out process for practice. So the ability for physicians who are anticipating that they're going to retire to, let's say, a year out, 
uh, take on a young physician who might be thinking about taking over that practice. And so you'd actually have two physicians working on the same caseload and having the same patient load, um, but one would be transitioning out and one would be transitioning in. Uh, and so over that over the year, the, the, the new position to the caseload would, would, would be able to, to be mentored by that retiring physician to get a better sense of the, their patient's needs. Uh, and so when they that when that the, the, that retirement date came about, that physician could feel positive about retiring and not leaving their their patients sort of in the lurch. And that young that early career physician um, has had the benefit of that mentorship for the year. Uh, that to me is a win win for both physicians and for the patients. Um, and that process is not clear. Uh, we understand it's available. But it's not clear um, uh, to us who can access that uh, and what are, what's sort of the policy and uh, around that. But to, in, in in our world, in terms of recruiting young physicians uh, or new physicians, um, the idea of having that mentor there t uh, in the in the first months of practice is is very very appealing for for new to Nova Scotia physicians. Ms. Coombs. Thank you. Uh, we have the number of 81 va 181 vacancies. Um, I think transitioning in, transitioning out is a, a great idea. I've had I know physicians in my area have um, thought they had doctors in place and found out that they didn't. And that kind of one year mentorship would be they definitely have it. Um, you both mentioned as well as did um, the other two doctors that um, it's great that we have the medical we have a medical school here in Nova Scotia and that we have uh, doctors there for us. Uh, I'm just wondering though for Nova Scotians or even maritime um, individuals who've gone on to train elsewhere to be physicians or doctor and doc physicians. Um, can you tell us what is being done to remove the barriers for those that decide to study out of province? Dr. McDonald. So currently I am a preceptor as we speak uh, for the practice ready assessment program and that was developed in conjunction with Dalhousie and Department of Health and Wellness for physicians who trained um, and did residencies in other countries that aren't typically recognized in Canada as having equivalent um, medical training. Order. Time has lapsed. We'll move over to the Liberal Caucus with Ms. Di Costanzo. 20 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Maybe the doctor can finish her uh, comments as well before I ask my questions. Please go ahead. Uh, so, so that's program. Uh, Dr. McDonald, right. sorry. <laughs> I'll get used to this eventually. <laughs> so that's one program that's being implemented now. It's now in the second iteration. Um, myself, I am an IMG. So when I did my residency, I matched to the IMG spot at the Annapolis site and that had a return of service with it. Um, in terms of beyond that, I know Doctors Nova Scotia has worked very diligently, as has Nova Scotia Health, to create more networking for international medical graduates who are not necessarily from Canada to make that transition because that transition to Canada has been a huge learning curve for many and there's been a lot of work being done in that space. Ms. Di Costanzo. Perfect, thank you. Sorry. Thank, th um, it's, it's an amazing thing to, to hear from Doctors Nova Scotia here and, 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 and really looking forward to hearing also about the, the things that um, had, uh, you commented how COVID has helped bring the, the health uh, team or the, the, the workers together. I actually ran into a friend of mine who was a doctor at a funeral last week and I was amazed at how he spoke to me and how hopeful he is. You know, he said, uh, um, you know, we, we closed all the clinics maybe too, too soon, but we didn't know what was expecting, but we know how to do it for the second wave. We are prepared. We are this. There was nothing but hope and, and planning and knowing what they're looking for. And I hadn't heard that for a long time. So I was really happy to hear how he is talking about the medical system and how he feels he's included in it, which is great. It it's, it's compares to what you just told us as well, which is wonderful. My question is really in regards to the succession. My doctor is um, in his mid 50s, late 50s, and uh, he, he took over from his father and who was 
doctor for my in-laws for many years, and now his son is a doctor. And three, four years ago, his son moved to Toronto, didn't want to take the... So I want to know from you, what are you doing to change? And you spoke a little bit about you know, the, the transition or bringing a younger doctor. I want to know why he's running away from his father's practice. I know his father has a large and a, a very dedicated doctor that you, you, he, he's never able to keep time exactly because he spends time with his patients. He's a very caring, wonderful doctor. But also, what else are you doing so that we can have those doctors come back? What can I tell my doctor, you know, that things have changed, maybe attract your son back here? <laughs> Doc, uh, Ms. McCready-Williams. Thank you. Um, it's a great question. Uh, I think we've talked about recruitment. Uh, with recruitment is retention. So, so there's a couple of things that we talked about in our opening comments that have been very helpful in the recruitment space. So competitive compensation, we were the lowest paid in Canada uh, prior to this past negotiations, physicians. And so for many reasons related to compensation, physicians were going to New Brunswick, PEI, Newfoundland or elsewhere to Toronto, other places, uh, to do the same work for significantly more money. Uh, and with a with a, a, you know, with a su supply and demand that made sense to a lot of physicians who graduate with a significant debt load. Um, but but we are, we're pretty marketable right now in that space. Um, but it's not just about compensation. Uh, just like uh, compensation is not the driver of engaged employees in a, in, in a you know, in a high performing organization. It's, it's more than just compensation that's necessary, and that's a feeling of being valued, uh, being engaged in health system decision making, um, things like that that are as important to our members, the work environment as important to physicians uh, as, as compensation. So, so the more we can do to, um, uh, to improve Nova Scotia as a place to work, and, and that's everyone's responsibility, um, will go a long way to keeping the physicians who come here. So, so we've, done a, we, we've done some really, really good work uh, around um, supporting, uh, uh, my colleague Dr. McDonald talked about, I, she's an IMG, that's an international medical graduate, if, if you didn't know what that stood for, um, physicians trained outside of Canada. So um, we, right now, um, Nova Scotia Health uh, attracts uh, I think it's, we're close to 40% of physicians attracted to Nova Scotia who come to Nova Scotia uh, are trained elsewhere. And, uh, and so ensuring that their pathway to licensure, their ability to, to um, go from a defined license with the College of Physicians and Surgeons to, uh, to passing the appropriate exams and, and feeling welcomed into their community uh, is, is, we call it a, a, a successful pathway to licensure. That's an initiative that, that we're working on with Dalhousie, with Nova Scotia Health, um, with the College of Physicians Sur and, and Surgeons uh, and Doctors Nova Scotia, providing those uh, international medical graduates with supports from an education perspective, from a mentoring perspective, being settled into their communities, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and so that work is underway. I think another, another thing that we've seen that will attract uh, physicians back to Nova Scotia is the extent to which, and I, I talked about recruitment being a, a, it's a team effort, you know? And we've seen communities, particularly rural communities, um, come together and create full-time positions dedicated to recruiting physicians to their communities. Uh, and they're doing fantastic work. With, with all of us to, uh, to make sure that when that physician is being recruited, um, that they, they meet the community, that, they're, that there's a job for their, their partner, that their kids are introduced to other kids, there's a place to live. I mean, it is, it is, a, it is a wrapping your arms around that physician and their family uh, and encouraging them uh, to come here and, and just, ex you know, because this is a wonderful place to live and work. Uh, and so, so we've seen a real um, energy to, uh, to recruiting 
back to Nova Scotia in a way that we hadn't seen for a number of years. And again, it's a team effort. So, uh, so um, I, you know, encourage that physician who went to Toronto to come to come back, <laughs> come back to the East Coast. It's a it's a great place to live and work. Ms. De Costanzo. Thank you. He is from here, and I'm hoping he will be back. Um, the, the other question I had is, what is Doctors Nova Scotia's position on other um, um, health care uh, providers like nurse practitioners, physician assistant, and family practice anesthetist, where uh, the demand on doctors is so high, and we have, and where is Doctors Nova Scotia in relieving some of the things that can be done by others? including pharmacists as well, which is moving in the right direction so that the doctors work on the more serious and more difficult things. So what is your position and how are you dealing with that? Ms. McCready-Williams. Thank you. Doctors Nova Scotia uh, supports collaborative practice. We have that, that is the future, is, is collaborative practice, whether it be at the, the family physician or uh, at a specialist level. Um, there's enough work to go around. We are a sick, unhealthy popula aging population, um, as much as we might try to deny that. Uh, we are top in Canada with a number of chronic diseases. There's a lot of care that needs to be delivered. Um, family physicians play a unique role as the backbone of the medical system. and. Uh, working collaboratively with nurse practitioners, with social workers, with physiotherapists, with others, family practice nurses and others in the community is, is the gold standard um, that, you know, that, um, you know, everybody working to their full scope uh, and, um, and, and uh, you know, with a, with a physician uniquely positioned because of their training to deal with the most complex cases. Um, that's ideal, and you need a payment model to support that. <laughs> so that you need you need a, a a payment model that I'm really pleased we've been able to to um, to to capture in our recent contract, and are going to be hopefully finishing developing and piloting next year. Uh, and that's a blended capitation model where where a collaborative practice receives uh, receives income based on the age and gender of their of their patient base uh, and then it's up to the collaborative physicians and allied health providers to figure out how to best care for those patients uh, with everybody working to their full scope um, in a in a team environment that that's that's what we believe is the future in this province um, uh, and so, um, yeah, I'll just pass it on to my colleague. Dr. McDonald. Sorry. Just to Nancy's point, what she described is where I feel I will thrive. Right now, I'm in a collaborative practice in a fee-for-service model. We have a social worker, we have a nurse practitioner, we have a family practice nurse, and it's great. But our ability to use all of our providers to their maximum potential um, is somewhat limited by the model we're in. But what she described, that's the way I want to practice at my highest level all the time, highest efficiency, and I think that's going to be the best care for patients as well. Ms. De Costanzo. Oh, oh, Dr. <laughs> Hawker. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add to what Dr. McDonald said. As you know, I work at the North End Community Health Center, and we are an APP, and we practice very differently than most family practices. We are highly collaborative. Um, we have community reps on our board, physician reps on our board. We are a charity, uh, and we have so many community programs that the standard uh, community health center might not have. I also spend a lot of my time collaborating with my mental, mental health workers, my occupational therapists, my social workers. We have two now. We actually need two, maybe even three. One was just not enough at that health center. And uh, unlike Dr. McDonald, who's fee-for-service, I am APP. And while it's not perfect, uh, the shadow billing does not, definitely does not capture all the work that I do. It does allow me to spend more time with my allied health professionals to making sure that my patients are seeing the right provider at the right time. Yeah. Ms. De Costanza. Thank you. And uh, I, I just want to comment that I have worked actually with Dr. Hawker for 
two or three years and have seen the amazing work that the uh, refugee clinic has provided for the refugees when they arrived and how important that is uh, in the first year or two of oh, when they arrive. Their needs are so different than the different of our uh, average and they haven't seen a doctor for three, four years. So having them been treated by a clinic that was almost I thought it was a collaborative, but it, it had a, a couple of nurses and they needed a social worker, I believe. But uh, it, it meant that those did not end up in emergency. And we all know how expensive emergency is. So having that collaborative ideas for different needs of different people is really the way to go. And I'm really hoping that, uh, you know, with your negotiations and, and you can keep that because every... Uh, community has different needs and it, it, it can uh, be supplied and the doctors become specialists in that community and things can move much faster and much better for us in, in the end of not ending up in an emergency. So I, uh, sorry, Dr. Hawker, please. <laughs> Dr. Har Hawker. Thank you. What you said just reminded me so much about the community health centre and the physicians I work with, um, especially around providing comprehensive care. And what comprehensive care in Windsor might look very different from inner north end Halifax. So one of our physicians, Dr. Genge, started a managed alcohol program at the peak of the pandemic. Um, myself and Dr. Fraser provide uh, care for substance use disorders, and that those are unique things that are needed in our community. So for us, that's providing comprehensive care and different models of payment like APP and the new blended capitation model would allow physicians to rearrange their scope of practice or the healthcare providers that they work with depending on what the need of that unique community is. And thank you for reminding me of that. Okay, Ms. DiCostanzo. I think I have uh, one um, one more question really is about the virtual care and how do you see that working with um, the, the immigrants and, and, and how have they been um, adapting to it and, and did that work as well? Ms. Ha Dr. Hawker. Sorry. Thank you. So I actually wasn't working at the newcomer clinic during the pandemic, but I have spoken to some of the colleagues who were. Uh, I'm actually working part-time just until a few more weeks because we have a almost one year old at home. Um, so as you can imagine, seeing patients that uh, have limited English proficiency can be challenging even in person. It's surprising how much language comes just from body language and, and gestures, even when you have an interpreter in the room. I was very lucky to have Rafa as, a, as an interpreter many times. Um, Anytime, even before the pandemic, sometimes we'd have to phone a patient about some sort of urgent blood test. At that time, you would call the interpreter who would then three-way in the patient, and you can imagine how challenging that was. Um, video does help a little bit because you still get the body cues. However, access to the technology, sometimes the patients might not have a smartphone or a laptop or, or reliable internet sources. And then also just understanding how to use the technology. You require um, brochures on how to use Zoom, for instance, in, in Arabic and other languages. So there's definitely more barriers and I think the uptake took longer and I think it's something that they're still working on to improve for the second wave. Ms. DiCostanzo. Thank you very much. And I'll pass it on to my colleague, Mr. Irving. Mr. Irving. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you to our guests and for all your work uh, keeping Nova Scotians healthy, particularly during the uh, pandemic. I just want to return to the numbers which can sometimes uh, be a little misleading or there's different numbers from different places. I think my colleague was referring to we're short where we've lost 400 doctors in the last number of years. Your, your figures show an increase of 55 new doctors. Is it fair to say that that is accurate information? You, you stand by those numbers. They're very solid based on membership and fees. Ms. McCready-Williams. Yeah. Yes, we have um, 2,553 physicians who have paid membership dues to us in 2020, 2020. Mr. Irving. Thank you. And I believe you said that 47% of them were family docs, which would mean about 26 family doc new family doctors 
over the last year. And I was just trying to reconcile that with our, I think, other fairly solid number is the monthly uh, need a family practice list. And so from January 19, we are at 61,000, dropping now to around 47. Uh, and I guess my question is, 26 family docs, what would be their average patient load? Because I think there is a challenge in trying to determine how many we doc doctors we need. I think the health authority is using 1,300, but it's a bit fuzzy. I've talked to my doctor. He's 1,800 to 2,000. I talked to another doctor at, at an event who says, I, I can't see how you can do more than 1,000. Is there a guidance that you provide uh, your physicians on how many patients is, is the right load? Ms. McCready Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. The short answer is no. Uh, it, uh, it depends on the physician and on their patient base. Uh, if they have a relatively young uh, patient cohort, uh, they may be able to carry more than, than, than uh, obviously a, you know, an older patient base. Um, you know, you hear the, the, the figure 1350 uh, discussed by Nova Scotia Health, uh, but we don't we don't have uh, data on how many is a typical family practice. Perhaps my colleagues might be able to speak. Dr. To that. McDonald, I, I think when you look at typical, um, it's important to consider generational. So I would venture that your physician that you know can easily carry 1,800 is probably further along in career. That's the trend that I certainly see. There, there is a physician that works next door in my building and his patient list is somewhere like 4,000. So I think when we're looking at numbers, numbers don't necessarily mean access. For myself, I've slowly built my practice with the ebbs and flows of having a family and I have it around 1,100, 1,200. Right now I'm feeling that that's a bit too much for me um, with the other pieces of work I'm wanting to do. So when we're doing physician resource planning, I think it's important to look at the incoming physicians are not going to be carrying the same volume of patients that previous, ha previous have, but their ability to have access for the patients they do have and their ability to provide comprehensive care for those patients is probably going to be increased. Mr. Irving. Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 you know, if it's something you could work on, I think it would help everyone to try and get a sense of how many doctors. I, I know we're racing to get more and we're, we're making some good progress, um, uh, but it's always good to know where we're trying to get to a target and identify how many folks are retiring. Um, the other point to the numbers that I just wanted to uh, confirm with you um, is that our population is growing. So last year, we brought in 7,580 7, new Nova Scotians, and the year before that, it was around 5,400. So if we were at, with the same level of doctors, we'd actually have another 12,000 people on that list. So we are making progress. I, would, do you think that's fair to say in terms of us both bringing the list down 14,000 over the last two years, but also the 12,000 new Nova Scotians? Would that be fair to say? Uh, Ms. McCready Williams. So, um, I mean, I can't argue with your numbers. There, it seems it seems appropriate. Mm -hmm. Mr. Irving. Thank you. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you could expand on, like, we've had this uptick the last three months because of COVID. Um, uh, in in your opinion, what 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 has COVID, what has how has COVID made recruitment more challenging? Order. <laughs> Time has lapsed. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Irving. Uh, we'll turn to Ms. Adams for three minutes. Thank you. Um, for clarification, um, the numbers that I'm using come straight from the Nova Scotia Health Authority, and I'll table them if required. That lists the exact number of physicians. They listed it last year. There are 400 fewer physicians listed there compared to the year before. 
Um, so there's no doubt as to what those numbers suggest. Um, the province's own finding a primary care provider shows a nice lovely graph that shows exactly how many uh, times in the last year, well before COVID. Um, frankly, Nova Scotians are tired of there being uh, a reason why we don't have physicians. It's the amalgamation of the health authority. Um, I do not want to hear that it's COVID now um, as to why, frankly, Nova Scotia is now the safest place in the world. Um, that should, in fact, help us with recruitment. Um, so the last thing I want to ask with the time that I have is, in the past, we had um, some amazing emergency room physicians in the valley who um, up and left. And that, that time that they were leaving, they were feeling like their complaints over the last 10 years were not being heard, um, that they were expecting um, the recommendations from uh, an evaluation that was done of the Valley Regional Hospital to be implemented. The last note I have was from January 18th, saying that I think 17 of the 25 recommendations had been done. But their primary concern was that they felt that they had not been heard. There was a recommendation that there be considered an ombudsman to help um, support them uh, when they do have grievances. And one of the, the things that some may or may not be aware of is that in Saskatchewan, there was a recent ruling out there, a uh, provincial court ruling that says criticism of healthcare systems is in the public interest. And when it comes from frontline healthcare workers, it can lead to positive change. So I'm just wondering if, if one of you could comment on how well are we dealing with exit interviews on physicians who are leaving? who do have concerns, who feel like they're not, their voices aren't being heard. Um, these guys all left, which is a terrible loss. Gina McGillivray left. I'm just wondering what role Doctors Nova Scotia has in collecting that information in exit interviews um, or ensuring that physicians in this province feel like they're not helpless. I think that was one of the words, the powerlessness. Um, what, what avenues have you been trying to work on to improve their sense that their voices are in fact going to be listened to in the future? You have only a few seconds to answer that. <laughs> uh, conflict resolution is, is, um, is something that we believe at Doctors Nova Scotia. Order, sorry, time has lapsed. <laughs> Um, we'll turn it over to the NDP caucus for three minutes. Ms. Coombs. Oh. Thank you very much. Um, I have a quick question. Um, and this has to do with engaging in recruitment strategies as well as, retain, um, as, well as um, retention. And that is, uh, some people might wonder if the approach to recruitment is piecemeal. We have uh, local community groups, we have, com we have municipalities, we have communities, culture, and heritage. And I'm just wondering if some people might say it's piecemeal or splintered. And are, these pit are, these, are there pitfalls to having the work not housed in one place? Ms. McCready Williams. I sit on a, a recruitment retention advisory committee. It's a multi-stakeholder group. Uh, it's chaired by the NSH. Uh, and it has everybody at the table. All partners interested in recruitment and retention are sitting around that table, including municipalities, everybody. Um, and, um, and we've made significant improvements in our coordination efforts. More can be done, but I know the NSH is, is, is uh, preparing a new recruitment, physician recruitment strategy that we've all had an input in shaping. Um, and so it, it, it has been somewhat scattered, but it's much improved over the past two, three years, I would say. Uh, still room for improvement, but I think everybody around that table knows that uh, together we can make a difference uh, in, in physician recruitment. Oh, okay. Ms. Coombs. My time to Sue LeBlanc. Pardon? I'll concede my time. Oh, Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you. Uh, oops. Um, thank you. I just wanted to ask, I mean, in the like 30 seconds that I have, um, I'm wondering about uh, the uh, survey done by Doctors Nova Scotia. Um, the public perception of doctor support by the government during the pandemic was not very high. The average response was 6.3 out of 10. 
Um, can you speak to whether your membership felt supported during the first wave? It sounded earlier on you said that the relationship seemed to be uh, uh, going well, but maybe that's but that's not the only source of support would be Nova Scotia Health. Um, do the do the physicians have access to proper PPE, staffing support, and that kind of thing? Real quick. Ms. McCready Williams. Yes, we um, community-based special or physicians now have access to PPE until the end of October. Uh, that was an issue at the beginning, but NSH worked very hard to consolidate um, procurement processes. So we did not see the PPE crisis in Nova Scotia that we saw in other provinces. And I was on a call weekly with my colleagues across the country for months on this issue. Um, uh, I would say, on the whole, physicians uh, here have felt more support from government uh, than they have in a, in a long time. Order, they time has lapsed for the NDP. We'll move it over to the Liberal Caucus. Mr. Horn, three minutes. Finish, <laughs> finish your thought, please. <laughs> please. You can finish your thought. Ms. McCready, will you? you. So um, this government was out of the gate very quickly on two things. Uh, and showed leadership in Canada, in, in our opinion. One would be uh, virtual care, putting in place virtual care at the same payment rate as 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 face-to-face -face and uh, uh, fees, which was uh, gold standard as far as we're concerned in Canada, uh, and we hope that continues. Um, and as well, an income stability program for physicians who were on fee-for-service when the essentially the healthcare system shut down it enabled those physicians to be redeployed where they where they needed to be to deliver COVID related supports, uh, and and that was best in class as well. So we we think tremendous leadership on those two fronts for sure. Mr. Horn. First of all, thank you for being here. It's been really interesting and and very thought provoking to all of us, I'm sure. Uh, I'd like to go down the recruitment. Uh, in, I guess street uh, talking about recruitment for rural areas in particular how you might change your recruiting ways to uh, encourage uh, new doctors to go to the uh, outside of the metro area. Dr. McCory. So I'm a pretty passionate uh, advocate for recruiting to the community. I actually am the opposite of a lot of people in that I live in the HRM and drive to my community. Um, I love working in the community so much that that works for us. My child care is here. I can be at work and not worry. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that we're really seeing is the leadership of Dalhousie. Um, so Dr. McDonald talked about her experience. We are now seeing as a maternity provider, we have a great interest in um, encouraging people to do collaborative practices that have many different facets, one of which being providing maternity care. Um, and we're now getting more and more in demands to come to Bridgewater to work on our model where we have an integrated model of midwives, family physicians, and obstetricians. Um, and the important part there is that the midwives feel supported, the family docs feel supported, and we as a specialist feel supported in that the use of our time is efficient and, and we talk about working at your best pocket. Everybody feels good if you're doing what you need to do and what you're uniquely positioned to do. And they get to see this model. Um, the way people were previously trained, it all happened in the ivory tower. And we know that's why everybody moves to Toronto. So if you want to engage people in your community, you need to bring them to the community and let them see the benefits of working in Order. the community. Order, time has lapsed. Um, we will ask for closing remarks, um, briefly. <laughs> oh, Do Dr. McCory. I want to thank you all for um, inviting us here today. And one of the things that I think is really important about us being here today is exactly what we've talked about today, that physicians need to have a role in the system in which we're expected to work. Um, and so we thank you for the invitation to share our experience. Um, when we were invited here, it was a totally different world. and. We are now still having to deal with concepts of physician recruitment and retention. Um, for example, I previously had a job in the NSHA before I became president of Doctors Nova Scotia. And, you know, we were able to recruit somebody from South Africa. Well, he's still coming. COVID has delayed that move by a year because he wasn't allowed to leave South Africa. But 
we, we've seen so much good happen in Nova Scotia. Somebody's previously said it's the safest place to be right now, and I think we all feel pretty happy to, to be here, um, running around with our masks, um, you know, to, to keep each other and keep our families safe. But the recruitment and retention work also has to be flexible. And so it's important that we don't just say, well, actually, we did a study in 2014, and it's important to the graduating residents then that, that we did X, Y, and Z. Virtual care is where we're at right now. We all need to figure out a way, because we know, we know, when we said two weeks back in March that it was never going to be two weeks, and it's important that we have a plan. This is going to be our lives for the next year and something. And so we need to keep our elderly patients safe. We need to keep our immunocompromised patients safe. We need to keep the economy going by keeping people working. And, and I'm glad that you have an interest in hearing what we think because we're actually contributing to the system, but it also makes us feel a part of the system to be invited to share our knowledge. Thank you, and thank you for being here with us today. Um, we have a business meeting, so you may be excused, and often the media is waiting outside, so I think in the red room is where they're taking any questions, so somebody will direct you if, they're, if they want to speak to you. Okay, everybody. Um, we are uh, doing an agenda setting today, so... Um, to, um, before we start, I just want to clarify a few things with um, the uh, proposed witnesses especially and, and um, just what we are doing. Um, to avoid procedural confusion, um, we're going to ask to discuss each each caucus's proposals before the formal motions are made, okay? And also, after discussion, ask each caucus to state each topic clearly in the form of a motion for the record. This is to help our clerk out. Um, they can make a separate motion for each topic, or you can do one motion with all the topics. We also are asking that members to indicate where they would accept a substitute, meaning um, we had instances where uh, the deputy minister wasn't able to come, but we had a designate in. Um, and so we want clarification that way. It saves the clerk a lot of back and forth and, and uh, a lot of confusion. Um, and also, um, the, um, in the case of a staff change, and we'll, you'll see one here on an ask um, when we go through. Uh, it would be helpful to state for the record whether the committee wants an individual to appear or the person holding the job title, okay? Um, um, also, you'll notice there's a seventh topic that came in, and that was one that was sent over from Veterans Affairs. So we won't take it as any of our topics, if we choose to do it, and that will be a vote, if we choose to do it, it will be added on after everyone has their topics as, a, as an extra meeting that, not an extra meeting, but it would be the next meeting before we go through an agenda setting again. Ms. Adams. So we were looking for clarification on that. I was on the, the Veterans Committee when that motion was made. Um, it was an NDP motion, so therefore it was suggested that the NDP consider that for a topic for this committee. So what I'm concerned or confused about and looking for clarification is the NDP have two topics. So had they wanted that to be one of their two topics, would that not have been the opportunity to put it in at that time? Because we all have a set number of topics we're allowed to introduce. So I just am looking for the precedence of adding it, can another committee simply add topics to our agenda without it being one of our own I'll ask the picks? clerk for clarification. Uh, 
they've put forward two suggestions, but at the end of this exercise, I think the NDP will have one topic that the committee has chosen. Uh, this other one, this one at the bottom that came to us from the Veterans Affairs Committee, yes, it was raised in Veterans Affairs by the NDP members, but it was referred to this committee by the all-party committee, by the entire Veterans Affairs Committee in a letter from Chair Rafa Di, Di Costanzo. So, um, it's, it's my understanding, past practice has usually been that um, it, it comes from a committee, it doesn't come from a caucus, but that's up to members to decide. Um, Ms. Adams. So my understanding, because I, as again, I was at the meeting, that the intent was that they had, a committee had an idea, therefore it would be considered not as an additional agenda item on, on the agenda setting, but that the, the party that wanted to bring it forward could consider bringing it forward here. I guess I'm concerned or, or questioning, does that mean that if we were at another committee, that community services, the, the Liberals or the PC or the NDP could put forth two ideas and have it voted, voted up here, and that would extend us to being allowed to submit possibly five agenda items? Yep. I'm, I'm just wanting clarification that if that's the case, that's a precedence that may Mr. Irving. be new. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, agree with my colleague here to the right. Um, my understanding and our past practices have been as if there are external requests, whether that be public or in this case it's a committee, that any one of the three caucuses could choose to put it forward as one of their two, three or one subjects. Uh, that would, uh, that's the process that we've used. I, I think the argument that Ms. Adams makes is we could end up with five or six requests that get tacked on to the, the uh, six slots that we have now. So uh, I would suggest that that, uh, that other can be put forward by any one of the three caucuses uh, as one of their allotted topics. Okay, any comment? Is that, Mr. Hebb, is that? That's entirely up to the committee. Okay, Ms. Adams has a motion on the, we'll make a motion. I would like to make a motion now that when committee topics come through other committees that they not be tacked on to the allotted spots for us to propose a topic, but that they, any one of the three party or four parties at whichever, have the right to introduce that topic as one of their slotted proposed topics. Okay, any discussion? We'll call for a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, the motion is carried. So we will delete that one unless, you, unless the NDP would like to add it to your list of topics when we come to it, okay? All right, so we will go to um, the, we'll start with the Liberal Caucus. Uh, you get to choose, um, bring four, Three, um, three topics of preference. Mr. Irving. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Do you want all three? You can do all three or one at a time. Why don't we do all three and, and move on here? Um, we'd like to propose the following three topics, the Ronald McDonald House and, House and its role in the community. Uh, witnesses would be staff from Ronald McDonald House. Uh, the second topic is with respect to ongoing work with organ issue donations, and the witness would be Dr. Stephen Bede and any members of his team that uh, he would like with him. And then the uh, third topic uh, are, is local efforts to welcome doctors to community, and we'd like the witnesses to be Carrie Monroe and Rebecca Rose of the Armouth Chamber of Commerce. Okay, so there's three topics. Um, that is that is a motion, so we'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Did we have discussion? Oh, did you want discussion? Okay. Okay, um, Ms. LeBlanc. Uh, well, thank you. I'm sorry, I, can't, I don't remember how this process works. As I'm fairly newish to this, I mean, you all are, to this committee. Um, 
Uh, I just, I wanted to just sort of talk about the uh, Liberal Caucus's proposals. Um, I think all of them are important, really important uh, subjects. Um, but I do recognize that our committee has been on hiatus, as it were, forced hiatus, for the last several months. Uh, and we're in the middle of a global health pandemic. And so I feel like uh, what I would like to see on the upcoming agenda items in the upcoming meetings is uh, our conversations that have to do with uh, our healthcare system and how the pandemic is affecting it and how we are um, how we are reacting to a global health pandemic. Uh, I think that obviously, like I said, and I want to reiterate this, that these are important topics, but I feel like there are more pressing topics at the moment. And so I frankly am baffled by some of the choices here when uh, there are, are uh, seemingly uh, many, many things to discuss. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Adams. Thank you, I, I guess I would like to echo those so same uh, sentiments as well. And the one item that is being left off is the one dealing with staffing levels um, for our healthcare system. Um, so I agree with the, the NDP member that COVID-19, long-term care, um, all of these issues should have been on their list. And um, moving forward, we could always re-entertain the thought of moving to um, having more health committee sessions to make up for the fact that we were shut down for seven months. Um, we won't introduce that again today, but uh, I think that moving forward, we definitely wanna focus on some of the key issues that we're facing because of the pandemic, thank you. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion is carried. The Liberals have their three topics. Noted by the clerk. Thank you. Um, the PC caucus, who wants to bring that? Ms. Adams. So the very first topic as listed there is the issue of long-term care, because that was the sector that was most impacted by COVID-19 and the wait times. So that is number one. Um, I, can I interject? Yep. Um, we only have seating for six people. So you have more than six witnesses on your list. So can you be specific as to who your preferences, I guess, are? Um, I guess then I don't want to leave out any one of the unions, and we've had the deputy minister here before, so I'm going to suggest we leave out the deputy minister because we do need um, Ms. Lopez and Ms. Stevens. Okay. Noted by the clerk. Okay. I'm sorry. And your second topic? Uh, so the second one that we want to bring in is related to the healthcare system human resources because of the shortages that we're continuing to experience in most of the sectors in healthcare in the province. Okay. It's, it's the first one and the third one. Third one. Um, and, and I just wanted to interject um, that the, I was in discussion with the clerk prior to this and you, your other topic where uh, this is just a reminder for all members that when you're, it's my understanding that um, you may invite a minister, um, but they are not compelled. or or any MLA is not compelled to attend, you can invite. So just when you, um, in the future dates, when people are listing their witnesses, be, be aware of that. And we checked that out with um, Mr. Hebb and, and that, that was his wording. So the, oh, Mr. Irving. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just with respect to the uh, first topic, it's uh, fairly general when it's name here, long-term care. Are there any specifics in the long-term care system that you are interested in discussing here? Uh, I noticed that the NDP have a similar topic uh, with respect to long-term care, COVID-19, and preparation for a second wave. I don't know if that's the one that they're bringing forward, uh, but I'm just wondering if the PC caucus could enlighten us on exactly what aspects of long-term care they'd like to uh, have witnesses present on. Ms. Adams? Certainly. So the, given the, who the people are that we have listed there, there are huge staffing issues in long-term care. And there are also major challenges with infrastructure spending uh, as well as budget. 
and how human resources have been allocated both before, during, and now after COVID-19. So this is specifically looking at how long-term care is staffed, the shortages that are being faced um, by these facilities, the lack of um, physicians and the impact that that has had on them. And um, because we didn't have, uh, when they looked at uh, Northwood, there was not um, an inquiry done. It was just uh, some recommendations without an actual report. Um, we want to delve more into what happened in terms of long-term care across the province because we are going to be possibly facing a second wave and we want more information with respect to being prepared for the future. Okay. Are we ready? Ready for a vote? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The motion is carried. We have the two topics for the end, for the PC caucus. Um, and turning to the NDP caucus, Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, so uh, given the results of that vote, then we would like to put forward our second topic, which is the emergency mental health care slash services. Um, and uh, to be more specific about representatives we would like to hear from, I would, I would suggest that we would like to hear from the Deputy Minister of Health and Wellness, uh, the Head of uh, Mental Health and Addictions from the NSH, I mean, um, yeah, NSH, and uh, Head of Mental Health at IWK, and then a representative from the North End uh, Community Health Centre, um, somebody who was a lead on their uh, mental health walk-in uh, clinic pilot. Uh, I don't know who any of those names are, are, um, you know, given what we just heard from our guests, um, it, especially in relation to COVID-19, we know that mental health and addictions is a, a huge issue and emergency mental health is a huge issue in our province. But um, given what we've just heard from doctors uh, recognizing that uh, their patients' mental health has deteriorated over the last several months because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we feel like this is an even more important topic to bring forward at this time. Okay. Would you like to make that oh, as a, mo yes, okay. a motion? A motion. <laughs> okay. Ready for the vote? All those in favor? Opposed? The motion is carried. We have the topic for the NDP. We have, um, with, under our correspondences, we have a letter from Dr. Kevin Orrell, Deputy Minister of Health and Wellness, in response to a request for information made at the September 8th meeting. Uh, members were emailed this document on October 5th and again this morning. And our next meeting date is Tuesday, November... Pardon? Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity to, uh, to make a motion. Uh, we, we discussed at great lengths uh, with our witnesses um, this afternoon uh, the benefits not only for the physician community but for Nova Scotians uh, from Yarmouth to Sydney. Uh, and you know, there's, there are discussions uh, that are hopefully going to be taking place sooner than later to extend uh, telemedicine and virtual care in our province. However, uh, what I fear is that uh, we might be going on a three-month uh, to four-month uh, re-evaluation of that. Um, so what I'd like to, um, you know, and, and our witnesses also spoke about, you know, the, the ability of, of virtual care to provide some flexibility uh, to either, uh, you know, albeit maybe some minor element, but to improve their work conditions. Um, Dr. McQuarrie said that, uh, you know, virtual care should be here to stay. Um, they've made their position very clear here this afternoon. Um, so I'd like to make a motion that we write to the new uh, Minister of Health and Wellness uh, to uh, extend uh, virtual care services while at the same time forming a virtual care task force as has been done at a national level. Uh, and this would be to ensure that all stakeholders that uh, need to be at the table can be consulted to ensure that virtual care is, is um, appropriately and, and rolled out effectively to not only benefit uh, all of our population, but also have the positive impact on, on our doctors as well. So I'd like to make that a motion, please. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Ready for the question? Oh, Mr. Irving. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, what, I won't be supporting this motion, uh, creating a task force when Doctors Nova Scotia is in the middle of having these discussions 
with the department does not seem appropriate to me. I think we all heard Dr. Nova Scotia's position on virtual care, and I think we're all in agreement that it is of value. I'm not disputing that, but uh, for this committee to get involved in the negotiations between uh, the department and Drs. Nova Scotia, I think would be inappropriate. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Dis Costanzo. I believe our department's already working on this, and with the extension, they'll be working to, 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 uh, to figure out what is positive and how things can be implemented correctly. They are working and looking into it. So. Mr. LeBlanc. Thank you, Madam Chair. And what I'm not uh, implying by this motion is to interfere with negotiations between Doctors Nova Scotia and the department. It is that the, there's a, uh, quite possibly an impact that the, the department might not want to commit to this um, for a prolonged period of time. Um, Doctors Nova Scotia have clearly outlined their position on virtual care. Uh, Nova Scotians, and 95% uh, of Nova Scotians have either had uh, uh, completely uh, satisfaction or partly satisfaction with virtual care to date. Uh, so I want to ensure that, you know, whether it be DHW, NSHA, uh, Doctors Nova Scotia or other stakeholders, that there can be uh, adequate and, and proper uh, consultations with all stakeholders, stakeholders in, involved to ensure, you know, if we're talking about billing codes, for example, or any other barriers uh, to imp implementing this uh, for a long term. This is something that we've, uh, as a party, we stand strong on, and, and I'm calling on Order. All members time to... has lapsed. The meeting is over. Um, Tuesday, November the 10th at 2.20. Uh, the time, 1 to 3. If the House is sitting, we will meet again. Uh, uh, we will meet at 9 o'clock to 11 o'clock in the morning. The meeting is adjourned.